In this video, we will look at torque, the cause of rotational motion. This topic requires some math, specifically a vector operation known as a cross product. So we will look at that first. A cross product is an operation that is done on two vectors. It produces another vector as its result. That means you have to find not only the size of the resulting vector, but also its direction. The size of the product is calculated like this. Take the size of the first vector, multiply it by the size of the second vector, and then multiply that by the sine of the angle between them. While there is a technique for calculating the direction of the cross product, we will simplify things for the purposes of this video and discuss the simplification in a few minutes. In linear motion, we introduced the idea of forces, pushes and pulls that cause acceleration. But there's a caveat to forces that we can now appreciate. If an object is free and unhinged, a force can only cause linear acceleration, acceleration in a straight line, if it passes through the center of mass. If a force does not pass through the center of mass, it causes rotation. And in fact, we don't even call it a force anymore. We call it a torque. Torque is calculated differently from force, and we can explain why using an everyday example. When you open a door, you're causing it to rotate around its hinges, but you always push the door on the jam side, never the hinge side. That's because when you're trying to make an object spin, the placement of the force matters. The further the force is exerted from the center of rotation, whether that's the center of mass or a hinge, the easier it is to spin the object. Torque has to account for both the size and location of the force. The equation for torque is as follows. R is the distance from the center of rotation to the point where the force is applied. That's called the lever arm. Torque equals lever arm cross force. Using the definition of cross product, we can say that the torque is calculated as the size of the lever arm multiplied by the size of the force, multiplied by the sine of the angle between them. In this example, we see a force of 30 newtons being applied a distance of 0.5 meters from the center of rotation. The angle between the lever arm and the force is 90 degrees. The size of the torque is therefore 0.5 meters times 30 newtons times the sine of 90 degrees. That works out to a torque of 15 newton meters. To keep things simple, we will describe the direction of the torque in terms of whether it would cause a counterclockwise rotation or a clockwise rotation. Counterclockwise is considered the positive direction, and clockwise is considered the negative direction. Since this torque is causing counterclockwise motion, we give it a value of positive 15 newton meters. If you are able to solve this puzzle, try it for the case where the angle between the force and the lever arm is 120 degrees. See if you can visualize what that torque would look like. In this image, we see two wheels that share a common axle. Each has a rope strung around it. The smaller wheel has a radius of 0.3 meters, and its rope is pulling on it with a force of 50 newtons. The larger wheel has a radius of 0.5 meters, and its rope is pulling it with a force of 40 newtons. What is the overall torque? For the smaller wheel, we can substitute the lever arm, that's the radius of the wheel, 0.3, and the force, 50 newtons. The angle between the two is 90 degrees. We get a torque of 15 newton meters. This torque would tend to rotate the small wheel clockwise, so we will call it negative 15 newton meters. For the larger wheel, the lever arm is 0.5 meters and the force is 40 newtons. 
Again, the angle between them is 90 degrees. This torque works out to 20 newtons, and it's counterclockwise, so it's positive. The total torque is therefore 20 newton meters minus 15 newton meters, or positive 5 newton meters. In the early part of this semester, we were introduced to Newton's laws. The first two laws state unbalanced forces cause acceleration, and total force equals mass times acceleration. These laws hold equally for rotation. If unbalanced forces cause acceleration, unbalanced torques cause angular acceleration. The relationship is total torque equals I alpha, where I is the moment of inertia, the difficulty of spinning something, which we saw in the last video, and alpha is the angular acceleration. Let's apply this to determine the angular acceleration of the wheels from earlier. The moment of inertia of the system is just the sum of the moments of inertia of each wheel. Suppose the smaller wheel has a mass of 8 kilograms and the larger wheel a mass of 16 kilograms. Then the moment of inertia of the smaller wheel around its center is given by this equation. We saw the standardized moment of inertia equations for different shapes in the last video. We can work out that the moment of inertia is 0.36 kilogram meters squared for the smaller wheel and 2 kilogram meters squared for the larger wheel. Finally, we can apply Newton's second for rotation to determine the angular acceleration. We divide the torque we found earlier, 5 Newton meters, by the total moment of inertia, 2.36 kilogram meters squared, to yield the angular acceleration. 2.12 radians per second squared counterclockwise. We have done pulley puzzles before, but we have always assumed the pulley wheel to be very light. We have ignored its moment of inertia. We've also made the related assumption that the tension is uniform throughout the string. Now we will revisit the pulley, but this time we will account for a heavy wheel which means we must account for its rotational inertia. We will also assume the tensions are not equal. Here, a 2 kilogram block and a 3 kilogram block are strung over a pulley. The wheel has a mass of 1 kilogram and a radius of 0.1 meters. What is the acceleration of the system? To solve this, we start by drawing free body diagrams of the two blocks and the wheel. The free body diagrams for the blocks just contain their weights and their tensions. Since we know the 2 kilogram block will ascend and the 3 kilogram block will descend, we will set the axes on each block such that the acceleration for both will be positive. The moment of inertia of the wheel is calculated as mr squared over 2, similar to how we did it in the previous puzzle. It is 0.005 kilogram meters squared. Now let us set up the force balances on the block and the torque balance on the wheel. For the wheel, there are two tensions, one from the 2 kilogram block that would turn it counterclockwise and one from the 3 kilogram block that would turn it clockwise. The torque from the left tension is 0.1 times T2, and the torque from the right tension is negative 0.1 times T3. We would need to use both torques in order to figure out the total torque, which is equal to I alpha. How do we solve for the accelerations? Well, if the string doesn't slip on the wheel, then the size of the linear acceleration of the string equals the size of the linear acceleration of the rim of the wheel. And we already know that the linear acceleration of the rim is equal to the angular acceleration times the radius. Now, 
we treat the linear acceleration of the blocks as positive, but since the wheel is spinning clockwise, its angular acceleration is negative. So correctly, the linear acceleration equals radius times negative angular acceleration. We then take this relationship and substitute that into Newton's second for the rotation of the wheel. From that point onwards, it is a matter of algebra to find out the accelerations of the blocks, and we can additionally find the angular acceleration of the wheel and the tensions in the strings. If you were able to solve this puzzle, you should next be able to do it in the case where one block is on a flat surface and a case where one block is on a ramp. There's a class of torque puzzles called statics puzzles. In a statics puzzle, an object is not moving. For this to occur, all the forces need to add up to zero and all the torques need to add up to zero. Here, we see a 3 meter, 15 kilogram ladder leaning against a wall at an angle of 50 degrees. The wall is frictionless, but the ground is not. The ladder is not moving. It feels four forces, weight, normal from the ground, friction with the ground, and normal with the wall. What are the values of the two normal forces and the coefficient of friction? The first step is to fill in some more details about the drawing, the sizes of the angles and the locations where the forces are acting. Remember that the sum of angles in a triangle is 180 degrees and that weight always operates at the center of mass. I set the origin where the ladder touches the ground. I'll explain the logic for this in a few minutes. We'll start by setting up Newton's second law for the y direction. There are two forces acting in the y direction, the normal force from the ground pointed up and the weight pointed down. Since the acceleration in y is zero, these two forces must cancel out. And so we can calculate the normal force from the ground. Next, the x direction. Static friction points right and the normal force from the wall points left. These also cancel out to zero, but there are two unknown variables, the normal force from the wall and the coefficient of static friction. So next, we have to do the torque balance. There was a reason why I placed the origin at the left corner. It's because the origin always is located at the center of rotation for torque, but if the object isn't rotating, you can consider any location to be the center of rotation. So you can put the origin wherever you like. At the left corner, two forces would pass through the origin or the center of rotation which means their lever arms are zero and they will exert zero torque. So the only torques to worry about are from the two remaining forces, weight and the normal force from the wall. We can find the torque from weight by multiplying it by the lever arm, in this case 1.5 meters, times the sine of 40 degrees, since that's the angle the weight force makes with the lever arm. This is a clockwise torque. We can find the torque from the normal force at the wall similarly. This is a counterclockwise torque. These torques must cancel out. A little algebra will tell us the size of the normal force and the minimum value of the coefficient of static friction. If you could solve this, try doing the puzzle with an 80 kilogram person standing on a rung 0.5 meters away from the base of the ladder. If you can do that, then puzzles like an unmoving seesaw or a person standing on a suspended scaffold would be a piece of cake for you. This video introduced torque and explored Newton's second law for rotation. We went through several sophisticated puzzles. Next time, we will examine how energy and momentum play into rotation.